I want to read this text critically, but also be okay if I'm enjoying parts of it. He's so sweet. He's like a total cinnamon roll. Like, did people read this and think this was a healthy relationship? Hi, welcome back to Beautifully Bookish Bethany, where I have new videos every week about books and the geeky mom lifestyle. In today's video, I'm starting my Twilight reading vlog. So I want to say, I've talked about this in other videos, but it has been a very, very difficult couple of weeks, not only for me, but for many, many people. As I'm filming this, it's June 4th, black people are being killed, there's police brutality, there's racism, we are uh, hopefully on the cusp of some major changes, and uh, I have been investing a lot of time and emotional work into talking about that online and you know it's a lot but I also am doing this Twilight read along so my plan for this weekend is to read Twilight which is book one. I'm going to be doing reading vlogs for all four of the original books and then for Midnight Sun when it comes out in August and then there will be live shows. I will link everything you need down below if you want to check it out. I have not read these books in a decade and even when I first read them I knew there were some issues with them so it's going to be an interesting experience like there are things that I loved about them initially, things that I didn't, and I thought it would be really interesting to reread them, to vlog my experience. I am starting that this morning. It's a Saturday. I have other things I need to do. I'm hoping I can get through it this weekend. We'll see how it goes. Before I get started though, in each of these videos, I do want to make some recommendations for you if you want to read books about werewolves and vampires that are by people of color because um, one thing that I will say about this is Stephanie Meyer is a white author. There has been a lot of discussion since these were published about some of the more racist things that were woven in, um, maybe not in super overt ways, but it's still there. And so partly because of that, I want to recommend to you in each of these videos at least one book that you might want to check out that will kind of give you your fix of the paranormal while supporting authors of color. So my first recommendation for you today is a book that is coming out in August. It is Lobizona by Romina Garber. I absolutely loved it. I read an e-arc of it. I will definitely be buying a finished copy. One of my favorite books I've read this year. It is a YA book that includes Latinx werewolves. It is own voices for the Latinx representation. It's really fantastic and it deals with a lot of big themes. So I will also link the video up above where I talk about it in more detail, one of my wrap ups where I review it. That is gonna be my recommendation for you for this video. With that said, let's dive into Twilight. I'm gonna start finishing my makeup, start the audiobook because I do have it downloaded from my library. So I'm probably gonna be flipping back and forth between the physical book and the audiobook, and uh, we'll see how far we get. I will update you guys a little bit later. So I just finished chapter one. It's definitely a mixed bag. On the one hand, she does a really great job of sucking you into the narrative right away, where you're wondering what's going on, you want to see what's going to happen, and even though I know the story, because I've read the books, I've seen the movies, I know what's happening, like, she does a good job of making it intriguing and it's not plotting. However, I have been tabbing things that I'm like, oh, right, there's that. So like, let's just, let's just see, shall we? So first up, um, we have Indian Reservation, um, not Native American. We've got some like maybe ableism here, um, talking about the Native American guy, Billy Black, who's in a wheelchair and can't drive anymore. And I remember that being something else I'm like keeping an eye on. It's also really interesting reading this right now because I had forgotten her dad is a police chief and just given the state of the world right now, that's interesting. This whole thing of the key is hidden under the eave by the door and locked up. Clearly this is supposed to be a small town where nothing bad happens. The police chief is leaving a key outside the door. So then on page 10, we get the first of what is already many comments about skin color and it's always pale. So which like, look, I'm fine if we have a heroine with pale skin, but I just wanted to point out how frequently this happens. She has skin that's clear, almost translucent looking. She's pale, which, you know, works with like the vampire thing. But then she goes to school and she sees two girls uh, who are pale. At least my skin wouldn't be a standout here. So I'm assuming what this means is that everybody in this town is white. I'm guessing that's what that means. Also, like, why would you be worried about your skin being a standout because you're not tan? Like, guys, I don't know. Um, really? That's something you're worried about. Okay, sure. 
Sure, why not? Then, of course, we have to have our stereotypically nerdy character. We have Eric with skin problems who looks like the overly helpful chess club type. So he's the nice, nerdy, irritating guy who wants to be helpful and ends up with a crush on her. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's also a really irritating uh, thing that we have as a trope. Then we have a lot of other passages about people being pale, people having white chalky skin. Of course, the Cullens are going to because they're the vampires, but like it's repeated so often. When we initially are introduced to, I think it's Jessica who ends up becoming a friend, we don't get a description of her skin color, but she says that she has wild, dark, curly hair. So I'm like, okay, well, maybe that could be that she's black, or maybe that could be that as you said earlier, her skin isn't standing out, so maybe everyone in Forks is just white and she's like white with curly hair. Like it's really particularly interesting reading this right now in the midst of everything that's happening. And like this is all just in chapter one. This is in the first 28 pages. Now, like I said, this isn't to say it's not a fun book because it is. We've got Edward Cullen staring daggers at her in class when he has to sit next to her and she doesn't know why he hates her, trying to get transferred out of their science class and these like beautiful, mysterious siblings. Like it's very intriguing and makes you want to read more. I get why it's like a bingeable thing. And even the, the thing of using the word Indian with the Indian reservation, I was listening to that on audio and then later I was like, wait a minute, is that what she said? And I flipped back through the actual book and was like, yeah, okay. Like it's easy to kind of just breeze past if you're not looking for it. So I will continue reading. I probably am not, I'm not gonna be doing an update like every chapter. Like I guess this is the thing is I think it's okay to enjoy things that are problematic, but I think you also have to recognize what those problems are. And so I wanna read this text critically, but also be okay if I'm enjoying parts of it. So that's kind of the goal of this vlog. I know this is not like amazing literature or anything, but it's bingeable, it's enjoyable. Some people just hate reading this sort of thing. I don't, like I enjoy reading it, but reading it this time around, I'm also like, oh, okay, we're doing this. We're doing, we're doing a lot of stuff here, so. Hey guys, so it is late. I got caught up in a lot of work today, but I have done some more reading. I am six chapters in. We just had the chapter where she meets Jacob for the first time, and I had forgotten she's like pretty crappy to him. She basically like manipulates and uses him to get information um, about the Cullens and about his like family tribal history, which just seems really messed up and super disrespectful. It's also definitely standing out that like all the guys like her, like every guy she runs into is like into her. And, you know, maybe some of it can be explained by the fact that it's a small town and they've probably been in school with all of these people and she's like new and interesting. So there, there is that. But even so, it's a little bit a little over the top. So Edward is interesting. He is kind of got some like alpha behavior pushing her around a little bit deciding how things should be and where they should go and like it's very clear to me why I liked Jacob the first time that I read this he's so sweet he's like a total cinnamon roll but it sucks that Bella is being such a jerk to him I mean he doesn't know she is but she's like fake flirting and he's only 15 manipulating and using a teen boy of color not a good look so um yeah that is uh where we're at at this point it's chapter seven uh i will check in with you guys again in like another maybe 100 pages or so let you know how it's going hey guys so it is sunday i am more than halfway through twilight i feel like i'm probably gonna end up just doing like a long chat at the end of this but i'm definitely flying through it there have continued to be problems. Let's look at a few of the tabs and then I wanna do a little bit of a more general discussion of my thoughts. We just got done with the scene where we discover that he's a sparkly vampire and they talk about their feelings and how her smell like makes him crazy and all that. So I have thoughts, but first let me show you a few tabs. Okay, so this section was just kind of funny because it clearly is set back in the day when internet was much, much slower and it took forever for things to come up. And like, I don't know if we even had Google yet or barely, so I just found that like entertaining as 
Then this was kind of an issue. We have the whole thing of Edward saving her from these guys who try to assault her. Here's where she first describes one of them, a heavy set, dark haired man in his early 20s, wearing a flannel shirt open over a dirty t-shirt, cut off jeans and sandals. So we've got a guy with dark hair who's like dirty and creepy. But then like if we go over here, the dark one who'd spoken to me is one of the ones who goes after her. So I'm like, wait, I thought his hair was dark. Are you trying to imply that his skin is also dark? We're getting here as like criminal guys who are trying to creepily assault her. And then Edward is like the white savior. So, you know, there's that. I mean, I do get that it's a real thing to be scared as a woman and have people like following you. That's super creepy. But kind of this whole thing is like, ugh. Okay, this I just thought was funny, very classic. About three things I was absolutely positive. First, Edward was a vampire. Second, there was part of him, and I didn't know how potent that part might be that thirsted for my blood. And third, I was unconditionally and irrevocably in love with him. I feel like this is like the thing people quote so much, and it's so melodramatic. Moving on page 210, we have another instance of ableism. She's super clumsy and she describes it as being so clumsy that she's almost disabled. So that's great. Um, okay, so that's the end of where I've actually tabbed, but I have a few larger thoughts. So one thing that I think you can potentially critique here is that if Edward's interest in her blood is being used as a stand-in for sexual desire, then in light of like Me Too and consent, this sends a lot of really problematic messages. And I think it's arguable that that is what she's trying to do. Um, like I definitely grew up in a church community where that was the messaging we got that like guys can't help themselves and you, your responsibility is to do whatever you can to help protect them from themselves and don't cause your brother to stumble sort of thing, which I think is kind of a load of crap now, honestly, because like I think we all control our own choices and control what we do and like there's no such thing as this I can't help myself obviously a vampire is a different story but we do have this whole thing of her saying well what can I do to help maybe should I just like hide my neck or like and I'm like girl no <laughs> in terms of like the larger relationship I, I see why I was into this when I was 19. I see why the melodrama appealed to me and the intense emotions of it and the danger because I think that was where I was at when I was, you know, 19, 20 years old. That was exciting and that was what I wanted and I had a lot of really big feelings about things. Now I read it and I'm like, oh my God, this is kind of dumb. <laughs> Like, he's kind of controlling. He's not as great as you think he is. Like, and you should listen. And also, like, word to the wise, like, if somebody tells you who they are, you should listen. And he's like, it's dangerous for you to be near me. Well, he's not wrong. Um, anyway, so it, it's an interesting experience reading it now in my 30s. I think I have changed so much as a person. Continue to love Alice. I think Alice is one of the best characters. Bella is fine, and I think, honestly, I probably identified more with her before the films came out, because I think with Kristen Stewart coming on, I was like couldn't quite identify with her so much as Bella, and so, but now going back and reading it, because of the films, I can't kind of get her out of my head, and so I think probably the first time I read this, that was a little different as well, in terms of tone and what I was imagining. I think, like, my general thoughts are, there's a lot of problematic stuff the relationship is realistically probably kind of toxic, but then part of me does get it because I feel like, you know, when you're 17, when you're 18, sometimes those are kind of mistakes you make. And, you know, maybe teenagers today do better and maybe teenagers today know better, and I hope so, but I certainly didn't, probably for a variety of reasons at that age. And I have like mixed feelings about whether and to what extent we need to be didactic in books written for teenagers about what healthy relationships are and should look like. Like, did people read this and think this was a healthy relationship? I don't know, probably. Did I read this and think this was a healthy relationship? No, I was team Jacob. And I think it is horrible the way that she treats him. Poor guy who has a crush on her and guys, Jacob. Jacob should have been Endgame. That was always what I thought. I always, I always hated Breaking Dawn for Oh my god, and like Renesmee, we'll, we'll get into it when we get to that vlog, but guys, I like I hated Breaking Dawn when I first read it. I'm sure I'll probably hate it even more now, so yeah. I'm going to keep on reading. 
I am flying through it. It's very quick and easy to read. It's very bingeable. It's easy to see why this kind of took the world by storm. There is something about the darkness and something about the dangerous that is appealing, especially when you're a young person. And maybe not for everybody, but I think for a lot of us, that was for sure true. And this definitely appeals to that. I think where it becomes a problem is where it gets tied into sexuality, where if you read it in that way, where it's about him not protecting her from literally eating and killing her, but him protecting her virtue, then you get into like some other issues about the way that we handle um, sexuality and sex and kissing and stuff with teenagers. And I know that personally, my thoughts and beliefs when I first read these was very different from what it is now, because I was part of the whole like, I kiss dating goodbye generation. Anyway, so it's been, it's been interesting so far. I will keep reading. I will update you guys again once I make some more progress. Hey guys, so it's evening. I finished Twilight. Um, I don't know how exciting this video is actually going to be because it's less of like typical vlog footage and really just more me periodically talking about my experience reading it and discussing it, which I think is fine, hopefully. Overall thoughts on this are mixed. I definitely didn't like it as much as I did the first time I read it, which I, is not shocking. <laughs> like I was 19 when I read this. I'm now 33 and a very different person than I was at the time. I see why it appealed to me as much as it did back then. This is definitely not the kind of relationship or romance I prefer now. It's very melodramatic. Uh, I would say that Edward is kind of an alpha male, which we all know is not my favorite thing in romances. You know, there are definitely for like a YA book, like some things that you could consider toxic or problematic about the relationship. With YA, sometimes I'm a little hesitant to just fully call that out as a problem because I do think, I mean, at least for me and I think for other teenagers, there's something about this that can make you feel seen. And I, I don't know that necessarily why a romance always has to be super sanitized. That said, I have never liked the direction that the end of the series takes. This book is okay. Like it's, it has problems for sure. I think originally I gave this one four stars, would have been about a four star read for me. Now, two, probably. It's like two. I don't hate it. I get some of the appeal. I think Bella is kind of a jerk, especially with Jacob, which sucks. Jacob is just precious. I love Jacob. I love also the parent characters in here. I've got to say that I think there's some really, really great adult characters and like, Carlisle and Esme are just the best and I love Alice. I think that's the thing like she definitely has some characters that are really great like side characters who I like probably more than I do Edward and Bella and I still find it disappointing that Edward is endgame but I know I know I am in the minority so it seems. Okay so let's look at a few tabs and then I'll give you some final thoughts. One thing that I thought was interesting is that apparently Edward was a victim of the Spanish influenza. Reading that now in the wake of COVID is just kind of interesting hearing discussions of that. I just thought I would point that out. There are definitely some more concerning lines like this one where Edward says, bring on the shackles, I'm your prisoner. But his long hands formed manacles around my wrists as he spoke. So there's definitely some like... I, I mean, I mean, you can see where Fifty Shades of Grey like took this to like actual BDSM. <laughs> um, he, he's for sure like a dominant sort of alpha figure, you know, and we can talk about that even though he looks 17, technically he's much, much older. And if you think too hard about that, it's kind of gross. But, the, but like also part of me feels like that's sort of the trope of this sort of thing. I mean, the Vampire Diaries is, is similar. Like, it, it just kind of goes with the territory. So either you're comfortable with it or you're not. Court of Thorns and Roses is the same sort of thing. Anyway, okay. I will say there's definitely some, like, jealousy stuff and possessive stuff that makes me uncomfortable. Again, this goes with that alpha male trope that some people really like in their romance. I am not so much a fan of it, but, uh, yeah. Here's him being pissed off. We have other instances of this as well, of him being jealous about Jacob, being jealous about Mike. Uh, again, like not something I have a lot of patience for these days, but it, but I, not something that I'm necessarily going to call out entirely. Although 
I think it's worth having a discussion about because I think the concern is that teen girls might romanticize this. And yes, I'm sure probably they did and will. And I'm sure there are other books that do this also. It's like, how, how much do we trust teenagers to figure it out? Uh, you know, these are conversations that could be had. This I thought was really funny because people like to joke that in YA characters are always letting out a breath they forgot they were holding. And in this, Bella literally forgets to breathe around Edward and faints. So, you know, she, she really goes for it here, <laughs> which I just thought was kind of funny. And then the last thing I wanted to point out that was just kind of icky was this description of Billy Black. He's trying to warn her off of Edward and they're having a conversation. He pursed his thick lips as he considered that. Okay, are we being racist? Maybe the way that it's described? I don't know. Like, was that necessary? Okay. Time for some final thoughts. So there it is, guys. That was Twilight. I am sure there are things that I have missed. I'm sure that people who are actually Native American or Indigenous would maybe notice more things than what I noticed. But I will say for sure, there's like toxic relationships, which again, like that you find frequently in romance. I don't know that Twilight is really that unique in doing that, but it, it certainly has it. Of more concern is you've got like some low-key racist stuff going on of Bella being kind of a jerk and super manipulative to one of the only non-white characters that we have on the page. And so that's super problematic. There's ableist language in here. You know, I, I know a lot of people like to talk about sort of the weird, toxic nature of the relationship between Bella and Edward. And, and for sure, that is there. On the other hand, I think people mostly get up in arms about this because this was something that teenage girls were enjoying and some of it is like policing that because there are lots of people lots of grown people who read adult romance novels with alpha heroes that have very very similar tropes and so there is certainly plenty to criticize that said it sucks you in it's easy to read i read the whole thing in two days less than two days pretty easily even with everything that's been going on right now you know, these are very bingeable books. They have an interesting world. They've got some well-developed side characters. Like, you know, like I see why these are as popular as they are. I'll also say that after rereading this, I am kind of interested to see where she goes with Midnight Sun. Because since... Excuse the like screaming child in the background, guys. It's like almost bedtime. Oh my gosh. I will say I'm really curious to see what she does with Midnight Sun after reading this because it's all from Bella's perspective and there's a lot of time that Edward is off screen or we get like these kind of mysterious comments from him and I am interested to hear kind of what's going on inside his head, what his perspective is. I don't know. We'll, we'll see how it goes. So book one done. Um, for me, this one is going to be two stars and I get why I liked it so much. I'm really curious to see how New Moon goes because I think originally New Moon was my favorite book. And I'll talk more about why that is. I think for me, it was really about feeling very seen on the page. And I'm curious to see what my experience is like reading it now more than a decade later. This has been interesting. It's a controversial book and understandably so. People have a lot of nostalgia for the series and a lot of love for it, but there's also a lot of people who've been really hurt by it and that includes Native American readers and people of color. And that's kind of wrapped up in some of the stuff that went on with Stephanie Meyer during the filming of the movies. So I get that this is complicated and people have very <laughs> intense feelings on it, but um, hopefully this was interesting. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on Twilight. Did you reread it with me? Did you have thoughts? What was your experience like? Is it your first time? Have you read it before? Let me know in the comments down below. If you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.